Governor Clinton comes in third with 22% of the vote. The remaining 13% is undecided. 825 likely California voters were questioned. The sampling has a 3.5% margin of error. It was released this week by KCAL-TV in Los Angeles. Just ahead, we talk with Democratic presidential candidate Larry Agron. He began his campaign in New Hampshire earlier this year and is on the ballot in his native state of California. The former mayor of Irvine has been an advocate of deep cuts in defense spending in order to provide more money for domestic programs and urban infrastructure. Despite his lack of delegates, Mr. Agron says he has stayed in the race to debate the issues he wants the Democratic Party to address in this election year. The interview was conducted at his campaign headquarters in Orange County, California. Larry Agron, Democratic candidate for president with just a few days to go before the California primary. What will you be doing in these last few days before the voting? Well, mostly I'll be talking with people by way of talk radio programs, which are very popular here in California, a few TV opportunities that might be available to us, a campus appearance or two, and meeting with some supporters, especially in Southern California, where we have more support than elsewhere in the state. When you're on the talk radio programs and people call in, what are they asking you about? Well, typically they ask me, uh, why haven't we heard about you before? Especially if they're attracted to the program. And of course I explain that as a lifelong Democrat, I've nevertheless had great difficulties uh, being heard within my party in campaign uh, forums and debates. And at the same time, I remind them that I'm on the ballot in 40 states, especially here in California. So I try to give them a good reason to vote and to vote for me is especially uh, in light of the fact that here in California uh, things are already decided nationally and <coughs> our votes are largely votes of conscience at this point. Why have you had trouble from the party as you mentioned? Well I think a grave mistake has been made uh, within the DNC by Ron Brown chairman of our party, my party. The grave mistake has been this to believe that somehow we could build a strong democratic party on a very narrow base that is tilting right where the decisions are all made very early on in places like New Hampshire, South Dakota, Super Tuesday. Ron Brown's been very clear about this from the beginning. He wanted this thing over by Super Tuesday, and as a practical matter, it was. Well, that meant that people like me, voices at the margins, needed to be excluded from the beginning. And through the operation of uh, Ron Brown's office, state party chairs, I've been excluded from most of the significant national debates. I have taken part in some, some debates, some forums. People have seen me on C-SPAN, on CNN, and elsewhere. But it hasn't been uh, an opportunity to be a central part of that debate that I think, in the end, builds a far stronger party. How has that exclusion manifested itself? Um, overt, uh, subtle, how would you describe it? Well, I think it's subtle initially, and it becomes pretty overt. The subtlety uh, initially was this. In describing the field, uh, Ron Brown would initially describe it as six candidates worth watching, when I, in fact, was one of seven or eight candidates worth watching. And then after that, it became, uh, when Doug Wilder dropped out, five candidates worth watching. Uh, then the word was sent out to the media in that regard and to party chairs, who then systematically in organizing debates and forums would say, well, we've got now five candidates. And people like me, who were mounting true national campaigns, we've qualified for matching funds, I qualified for the ballot in over 40 jurisdictions, I simply couldn't be heard in these debates and in these forums. Now, there were some exceptions. In South Dakota, for example, the party was very open, and I participated in a statewide televised debate. In Massachusetts, it was a very open party. The U.S. Conference of Mayors invited me to participate in the candidate, the presidential candidate forum there, alongside with the others. In Buffalo, New York, similarly, I was invited to participate with the others. But then we got to the Bronx in New York. Uh, Governor Clinton had said after the Buffalo debate that he wanted me included in every debate and forum uh, for the balance of the campaign. Well, what happened in New York was that I was not invited to the Bronx debate. Uh, when I was not invited, uh, even though I solicited uh, an invitation time and again, I showed up nevertheless on the night of the debate and I requested to be heard. I stood at, as a member of the audience and I said, Mr. <coughs> Chairman, I respectfully request to be heard. I want to be included in tonight's forum as one of four 
actively campaigning Democratic presidential candidates here in New York. I've participated elsewhere with these candidates, and by all rights, I should be included tonight. At that point, six security officers were all over me. They tackled me, dragged me into the aisle, down a flight of stairs head first. I was held in police custody for four and a half hours. I was, of course, handcuffed initially. I was finally booked for disorderly conduct, if you can believe that. And the city of New York booked for disorderly conduct for simply requesting the right to participate in a candidate forum as I had participated in others. So that's what it's come to in our party, a very closed, narrow party at this point. And I think what saddened me most about that particular event was that there they were, Governor Clinton and Governor Brown, both of them know me, both of them have shared forums with me, and neither of them, neither of them, spoke out and said, Larry Agron ought to be included in this debate. I'll tell you, if Jerry Brown had done that, he would have won the New York primary. Instead, he lost it and lost it badly. We'll move along to some other topics, but before that, what's, what's f happened with that incident? Uh, was it resolved at all? No, not resolved. I thought they would drop the charges as soon as the New York primary was over, but in fact, they are prosecuting the case. Uh, tentatively, a court date is set for July 13th, which happens to be the first day of the Democratic National Convention in New York. And so I'm looking forward to defending myself. I'll have a few things to say about what I regard as a political prosecution that is uh, unbecoming a Democratic Party that ought to value Democratic inclusion. You mentioned receiving matching funds. What did your campaign have to accomplish to receive those funds? Well, to raise matching funds, we had to raise $5,000 at least in 20 separate states in contributions of $250 or less. This is something that normally is uh, uh, a real challenge and a definition of a national candidacy obviously became much more difficult for us being kept out of those initial nationally televised debates. But we went on to raise uh, about $300,000 uh, during the course of the campaign, most of it matchable, so we're very pleased to be able to continue a campaign, what I regard as a, a campaign of principle about very different choices and very different priorities for our country. What effect on your campaign will this influx of federal funds mean? Well, it means we're able to carry forward and stay in touch with our 10 to 15,000 supporters across the country, keeping them advised of what we're doing. Obviously, here in California, where we're competing June 2nd for primary votes, it allows us to travel about, to print literature, to distribute literature, to appear on radio and television, to do those things that a modest campaign, a campaign of principle, can still do. Talk about what an Agron presidency would mean when you're on these programs and talking to people. What are your priorities as president? My priorities, simply put, are these. To take immediate advantage of the end of the Cold War. To stop the nonsense of spending $300 billion a year for military purposes. To take three immediate steps to cut our military budget in half. Step number one, removing all U.S. forces from Western Europe and Japan. Their work is done there bring the troops home, the dependents home, close up the bases there, and keep the bases here at home open as we receive those demobilized troops. Step number two, cancel needless weapon systems like the B-2 bomber, the MX missile deployment system, Star Wars, these systems that cost us tens of billions of dollars and have no useful purpose whatsoever now. Let's convert those contracts to contracts to build mass transit, a railroad system for the United States of America, energy efficient heating and cooling systems, affordable housing. Let's put our scientists and engineers to work doing those things that need doing. And step number three, let's cut all foreign military aid, particularly that that historically has gone to dictators in places like Iraq, uh, El Salvador, and Panama. Then we take those $150 billion that ought to be available to us, not in five or 10 years, but within 18 to 24 months at the most, and redirect that peace dividend of $150 billion a year to our cities and towns in direct aid, to our school districts, again in direct aid, to building and rebuilding a public health and national health care system worthy of the American people, to building a transportation system worthy of the American people, to reclaiming our environment, and earmarking as well about $50 billion for some honest deficit reduction. That's what an Agron presidency would be about. That's what our campaign has been about. Where would the money in aid to the cities be directed? I would uh, propose sending $25 billion, or $100 per resident per year, to every city and town in America. It's a reenactment and enlargement of the old general revenue sharing program. No strings attached. Just return the resources to people at the local level. What would they do with it? 
Well, they'd probably use it to repair infrastructure, maybe to hire more police officers and engage in community policing, community-based and neighborhood-based policing, open and reopen public health clinics, libraries, child care centers. We know how to rebuild our cities and our towns from the neighborhoods right on up. We just need the resources. I certainly know this as someone who has served in local government for over 12 years and had the privilege to be mayor of my city for six years. Now look what happened. Los Angeles burned for the second time uh, in my adult lifetime. I grew up in Los Angeles. Uh, Governor Clinton and uh, President Bush visited Los Angeles. They engaged in a lot of hand wringing, a lot of uh, expressions of anguish. They promised nothing by way of material assistance. All they did was exhort us to pray and to cooperate. And then they got back to Washington, D.C., recognizing that this was not a message that was about to sell to the American people. So they patched together a self-serving, self-satisfied, bipartisan package of $6 billion in emergency urban aid, not just to Los Angeles, but for every city and town needing it in the country. By the time you slice up that pie, nobody's going to taste anything. Well, what I propose is that we earmark what we're earmarking for Europe, $6 billion every two weeks to defend Western European cities. We don't begin to spend that kind of money for American cities, but if we did, it would make all the difference in the world. Two weeks, we spend $6 billion in Western Europe. $6 billion is the total package that we spend for American cities in this emergency urban aid package. In this uh, campaign season, many candidates uh, use the, are using the buzzwords uh, an insider candidate, an outsider candidate. How would you describe yourself? Well, as the guy who has been uh, literally dragged out of an auditorium where a debate should have been taking place, I guess I'm the ultimate outsider, sitting in a police wagon for a couple of hours and then being booked at the Bronx police station uh, for simply asserting my right to participate as I had participated elsewhere, I guess that describes me as the ultimate outsider. I've never been arrested in my life, and here I am as a presidential candidate, arrested for the first time uh, for disorderly conduct, uh, simply asserting my right to be heard, but more important than my right to be heard, the right of millions of people to hear my voice and decide for themselves whether or not my ideas are worthy of support. Part of a national campaign is dealing with the press. Yes. How has the press treated you? Well, it's been interesting. In some cases, uh, we've received a lot of attention. Local press uh, is no problem. Reporters are happy to talk with us. Uh, I've been on uh, the McNeil Air News Hour, CNN. I was on the Larry King uh, radio show. I think that these kinds of appearances that are public affairs, uh, particularly radio uh, talk shows, I think are extremely valuable. Uh, those have been available to me and I've enjoyed that opportunity. But I'll tell you, the real problem is in framing the choices. And if uh, at the beginning of this long road to the White House, which has proved to be something of a, a cul-de-sac for me, if this uh, long road to the White House is framed by choices at the beginning that are very narrow, where the mainstream media say, oh, there are only five candidates. Oh, there are only six candidates. There are none others in the field. Uh, that really is a very sinister development in our system that has the effect of precluding voices at the margin that, in fact, are voices that people want to hear. That's the meaning of the Perot phenomenon. Here he is uh, now being lavished with all this coverage, largely because people are so disgusted at the narrow choices that have been presented to them by traditional party hacks in the Democratic Party as well as in the Republican Party. When you talked to people in the media about why you might not have gotten coverage at the national level, what kind of answers have you gotten? Usually it's something like this. Well, tell us when you're getting some coverage, because then we'll know we ought to be covering you. And as a matter of fact, a story along those lines was written in the Columbia Journalism Review, their magazine, that uh, uh, highlighted exactly the dynamic that's taking place here. You've got to be well known to get known, and when you don't get covered, of course, you fall in the polls and so forth. It was particularly frustrating to me when uh, in uh, January in New Hampshire, against overwhelming odds in two consecutive tracking polls, I had overtaken Jerry Brown. And when finally that second tracking poll was reported, uh, Tom Harkin had 7%. We, we three were at the bottom, of course. Tom Harkin had 7%. I had 4%. And Jerry Brown had 3%. On ABC News on Super Sunday, it was reported Tom Harkin 7%, Jerry Brown 3%. My 4% wasn't even reported. My name wasn't even listed. 
It was an overt act of political censorship on the part of ABC News, which distorted the news for the American people and, of course, did great damage to our campaign. And when we called them about it, uh, their response was, oh, that was the weekend crew. Well, some excuse. I mean, this is a serious act of political distortion. And uh, we just have, I think, a, a very arrogant uh, press. I speak of the national media, particularly the broadcast media, highly arrogant, uh, a power unto themselves, who feel responsible to uh, no one, accountable to no one, for the uh, abysmal standards that they're, uh, that they're upholding. You mentioned earlier Ross Perot. What effect is his possibly in entering the race having not only on the, the entire campaign but on what you're doing? Well, I think uh, his, his candidacy uh, is attractive to many of my supporters, largely because they are entirely frustrated. They feel the system is totally unresponsive to them. So they're interested in the Perot candidacy. Obviously, there's always the concern about what specifics uh, he holds uh, to be important, or whether or not he'll speak with specificity. They're concerned, too, whether or not he's a racist or whether or not he's uh, some kind of an anti-labor zealot. So far, I must say, my own reaction has been uh, generally positive. He is speaking to the concerns of the American people. And so far as to those specifics that he has enunciated, I think, uh, I think uh, what he says, much of it is very meritorious. He is going to shake up the system in a way that uh, it has not been shaken up in recent years. I wish my candidacy had had that effect. I think within the Democratic Party it would have had that effect, but in a much more constructive way, opening the party's doors to uh, an entire generation of people who feel closed out. In these final few days before the uh, primary, where are you marshalling your resources? Where are you focusing? Well, principally uh, spending time here in Orange County, uh, which is uh, where I was active politically. Orange County is a sizable county, uh, even though it's a uh, rightward leaning county. There are lots of Democrats here, and uh, we want to get them out to the polls. I was up in Santa Cruz as well, spending time in that university community, hoping for uh, some support there. And I'll be spending as much time as I can on, uh, as I say, talk radio shows, where we reach uh, thousands and thousands of people at a time. We're making a lot of phone calls, hoping to register a 1 to 2 percent. Uh, result here in California, which I think will provide a, a tiny amount of leverage for us at the Democratic National Convention and beyond. After all, our party's presumptive nominee, Bill Clinton, can't afford to kiss off even 1 percent or 2 percent of the vote. This is a man who will desperately need to broaden the party's base, and I hope he will be coming to me in that regard, as I hope he will be approaching others. You'll be attending the convention? Well, I'll be attending uh, first by starting out at the, uh, po at the uh, Bronx uh, Criminal Court. And then I, I do hope there'll be a place for me at the convention, although I want to note that I have not been uh, advised in that regard by Ron Brown. No one has spoken to me from Governor Clinton's campaign. I think this is a measure of the narrow nature of our current Democratic Party. I'm happy to receive a phone call, however, and cooperate in whatever ways I can. Larry Egren is a Democratic candidate for president. Thank you very much. Thank you. May I do one more thing? Sure. Leave my 800 number for folks. I've been carrying this around. There we go. Our campaign is still going, 1-800-727-9425. We're eager to stay in touch with people because this campaign will continue long after the convention. Thanks for taking time. Thank you. Appreciate it. If you would like to comment on our programming, write to us in care of the C-SPAN Networks at 400 North Capitol Street, Suite 650, Washington, D.C. Our zip code is 20001. Coming next, we will update our schedule, and then it's a discussion of women in society sponsored by Mother Jones magazine.